This is Paul Poirier at the American Banjo Museum. And we're doing our best to preserve, present, and promote the banjo in all of its styles. But we can't do it without you. We need your support. So I hope you'll join me in contributing to your American Banjo Museum. And thank you. Hi everybody, welcome to the American Banjo Museum and Virtual at Noon. My name is Johnny Beyer, I am the director of the museum and you're looking at a guy who has a dream job. I love the banjo, I love the banjo's music, its history, its heritage. And if you want to get into the real history of the banjo, I know of no better person than Dom Flemons. Dom Flemons was a member of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, one of the first groups that really embraced the black history of the banjo, that early history which is so often overlooked. Dom became a true scholar of early banjo history, and when we were looking into telling the story right, he was our go-to guy. In 2017, we invited Dom Flemons here to the museum where we had a chance to talk with him about that early banjo history and the early banjo playing styles, the early banjo repertoire. When we had Dom Flemons here, we got the real story of early banjo history from the true authority. The interview we did was too good not to share again. So we're gonna rewind our clock back to 2017 and take you back to a very unforgettable conversation with Dom Flemons. We're delighted you are here. We want to thank the Oklahoma Humanities Council for helping us bring Dom out and uh, uh, share some history, share some roots. I, I thought we'd start out by uh, getting to know you a little bit. How did you end up going from blues to rock and roll to jazz and gospel? How did all that lead to folk? Well, uh, my first introduction to folk music came through, uh, there was actually a documentary. I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona, and I was interested in the guitar from a documentary called uh, The History of Rock and Roll, actually. <laughs> and so it, it featured a lot of wonderful musicians like Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry and, you know, Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis and people like that. But there was an episode on the folk revival. and. Uh, Bob Dylan, and uh, there was a particular bit of footage of Bob Dylan going electric, uh, playing Maggie's Farm, that uh, got me interested in finding a movie called Festival, uh, which is about the Newport Folk Festival. So out in Phoenix, I didn't really know what the Newport Folk Festival was, but from this documentary, I was introduced to a, a large world of music that included people like uh, Doc Boggs and Clarence Ashley, uh, Elizabeth Cotton, who was a great banjo player. Did a baker. And from there, also, it also introduced me to bluegrass music, Flat and Scrubs, and, uh, and uh, the Osborne Brothers, and Reno and Smiley. And so from there, I just started looking up whatever I could, uh, going to the library and whatnot. And first, I started playing the, the guitar. Uh, but after a while, uh, I got interested in the banjo. I had a friend of mine that gave me a five string, and he had taken the fifth string out of it because he was another guitar player, and he, he didn't like that little string getting in the way. So uh, he passed it to me for a summer, and I started learning guitar songs on the banjo. And from there, it just opened up a whole new world. You know, I, my first instrument was, uh, were, was the drums, and I played percussion in the school band. And so for the banjo, I just loved the fact that it was like a drum that I could play like a guitar. And so I could play chords on it, but I could still use the same rhythmic rudiments. And so I started just uh, delving into everything I could. And I came across an album called uh, Sweet Emma, her Preservation Hall Jazz Band, which featured the wonderful Emmanuel Sales and uh, all the great Preservation Hall jazz musicians. And so from there, I just started incorporating everything I could into playing the banjo and just saw it was such a, a, uh, a wonderfully diverse instrument. And then in 2005, I went to an event called the Black Banjo Gathering, which was an event on the black and African roots of the banjo. And that got me deeper into the history. And so from there, I was, uh, I guess I was empowered to 
search into the music even farther and find connections uh, with the music that I might not have thought of before I went to the Gap. You play a kind of a frailing or claw hammer style on a four string plectrum style banjo. Where did that come from? Well, when I started uh, frailing, see, I heard all this music like uh, like Clarence Ashley and Doc Boggs, and I didn't I didn't know you needed five strings to frail. And so, for me, I just started trying to figure out how to pick it and and get that rhythm. Because of course, you know, rhythm you don't have to see; you just have to hear. So I started figuring out a way of. Uh, a lot of people say it's almost like a double thumbing style. So like if I was playing John Henry, I do. Open G tuning there. Yep, I'm using Open G, but I, I'll also play an Open D, and that was something I learned from when I was playing on the guitar. I found that the Open D tuning was such a, a beautiful sound. I tried it on the banjo. I also do sawmill tuning, which is uh, tuning the B up to C and doing some of the Clarence Ashley numbers. I also uh, have another tuning that I do, which is sort of a minor tuning where I take the B down to A, and mm -hmm. then it's a uh, it's almost like it gives you an extra finger on the left left hand because then you can kind of dip that note down and back into it. Mm -hmm. I play songs like Get Long Home Cindy and stuff like that in that tune. Wow. You, uh, you've often, in my uh, research, put together the words and music question that songwriters always ask, meaning take the poetry, take the storytelling of folk music. On its own, the words are wonderful. Take a wonderful folk song, it's wonderful, but put the two together and the parts exceed the, or the sum exceeds the parts. Tell us when that became a really important thing for you. Well, before I even played music, words were interesting to me. Right at the first moment that I went to a poetry class and we started talking about William Blake or um, uh, Wordsworth <laughs> or Shakespeare, uh, then I, when I went to college, I studied Chaucer and uh, uh, Mark Twain and Edwin Arlington Robinson and stuff like that. Like, words were always interesting to me. And that's what actually drew me into a lot of folk music were the words, and especially the ballads. And then the, I got into the blues and I found that that had its own sort of uh, uh, word play in it. Uh, and sort of the idea of having an elliptical lyric structure instead of like with a ballad you would have just a narrative structure like, you know, uh, part, part one, part two, part three. Uh, when you start having blues, you'd have elliptical things, which were uh, small vignettes of feelings, or, or like, um, you know, uh, uh, my baby left me on the train, she left me a mule to ride, and when that train left the station, uh, that mule laid down and died. And so you have a little vignette like that, and then you put it next to, if the river was whiskey and I was a diving duck, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. And blues is all based on that, so you take four or five different vignettes, and the emotional, uh, feeling that you get from all five of those vignettes give you a bigger emotional feeling all around. So it's just the lyrical structure of all those things really interested me. And so over time, I then started learning to put music with it. The uh, effect of Mike Seeger on you was really big along those lines, correct? Absolutely. I met him at the Black Banjo Gathering in 2005. I'd been a fan of his music for a while, and uh, one of his albums in particular, uh, called uh, solo uh, old-time country music uh, featured uh, some very unique arrangements uh, uh, with a variety of instruments that uh, I'd say they were atypical, you know? And so I was very inspired by his ideas of taking traditional music that, while in the actual traditional setting, vernacular setting, they wouldn't have been placed together. Just using ingenuity, you could actually make them work by putting them into the actual context and whatnot. Like I, I play a, a Henry Thomas number that um, 
but with the banjo and the quills, even though Henry Thomas played with the guitar, for example. But understanding how the music works together, I figured out a way to combine those two styles. And it, it, in, in one way, it presents old-time music in a way that is historically accurate and is authentic, but at the same time, it creates something new without needing to contemporize it. Because a lot of times I find with folk music, people tend to say, well, i got to make something new out of it, and then they just take contemporary music and down, water it down, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. Uh, along those lines, uh, in reclaiming some of the very early material, uh, do you favor contemporary artists leaving it alone, changing it, you know, to suit a modern day audience or softening it to suit a modern day audience? How do you feel about that? Well, it matters where the intent is. You know, if you, you understand the music, it's almost like a vocabulary. If you understand how the language is supposed to be used and used properly, then, then that can work great. Uh, if it's not used properly or it seems like it, you know, people are into what they're into. So, I, I mean, I can only say so much when it comes to an ultimate judgment on it. But, uh, but if, uh, you know, if, if you learn the language, you know, why not share it and use it? And for me, on my end, I've, I feel like that so many people uh, take the the foundation and then just run run away from it so often I found that it was more unique when I started playing professionally to keep with the foundation and find new ways to use that vocabulary that would be okay for contemporary audiences as well as uh, it would suit the needs of the record collectors or people who are fans of the music too because as a fan I I like to hear the music sound as good as the old stuff. It doesn't have to sound the same, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain feeling that you get that's, uh, uh, you know, it's a, natu it's a natural reaction to say, oh, they're doing it right, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about early banjo history, because we're talking about you being at the forefront of a movement to reclaim the black culture's roots with the banjo. But uh, the early history of the banjo was all black culture. 200 years of the first part of the banjo's history uh, was exclusive to, to the black culture. Uh, I'll give you a little background on history here. Uh, slaves were often brought through the Caribbean. So the banjo was first introduced in the Caribbean and uh, in basically the mid 1600s, you'll see references to banjos in the Caribbean. They weren't native to the Caribbean, they were brought by sl slaves that were being stopped there, either stopping in the Caribbean or on their way to the, uh, to the United States. But uh, the earliest banjos in the United States were brought, uh, or made by memory more than brought, uh, of instruments which were popular in African culture at the time. Uh, often a gourd covered with some sort of an animal skin. Uh, only hearsay can tell us that if the neck attached to that with strings on it was percussive or melodic. Uh, we, we don't know for sure, but how, however, if it was just kind of strummed like the back of a snare drum and creating a percussive sound, which evolved into being a melodic sound, we can't say for sure. But it took 200 years of evolution in the black culture to get the banjo established enough that it was then embraced by white culture. And that's the, uh, the, the very difficult time known as minstrelsy. I don't know if we'll ever escape the racism or the racial identity that minstrelsy uh, attached to the banjo. Do you? Do you feel that we'll get, you know, we can get over it and uh, accept today's music by today's musicians without a hint of, of that racist background? Well, that's, that's tricky. That's almost like trying to uh, take the America out of America in a certain way. Just, uh, just because the, the culture of the United States has so much racism within it, that doesn't necessarily negate the greatness of the overall picture. I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's one of those things that, especially when it comes to minstrelsy, you know, I, it, it's all about what you were first introduced to. You know, if it was someone that was maybe one generation or two generations older than me in the black, in black culture, they might say that there's no way to get over it at all. But that comes from, a lot of times, from very visceral uh, uh, experiences of racism being brought to, to the person. You know, like I was talking with a guy um, 
that was doing a documentary on the song Dixie, and he was mentioning that when he used to go to Old Miss in uh, Mississippi, whenever they played the song Dixie, that uh, meant uh, whenever the team would uh, get a touchdown at the football games, that meant you could throw trash on the black people, which I thought was so horrible. Oh. And that's a very visceral reaction. So this guy said, like, Dixie, I, he's, he had to go through his own journey of reclaiming Dixie as a song that he could listen to without thinking of that. As for me, my first exposure, I think uh, the first time I heard that the banjo was African was from Pete Seeger's How to Play the Five String Banjo book. Because he mentions it right off the bat, that it's, a, it's a, an African instrument. And then also for me, uh, right when I got into college and I started really delving into playing the banjo, I hadn't heard much about uh, black banjo players per se, but uh, when uh, I was out at the welcome week, they had a gigantic poster of Henry Tanner's The Banjo Lesson, which of, of course I love this museum because it has that beautiful repl replica of uh, the banjo lesson. And so for me, it was the banjo wasn't necessarily an instrument that was uh, uh, removed from black culture. It was something that was a part of black culture. And then also my interest in early country blues was something that I was able to I was able to take in that history a lot easier because I had spent time listening to jug band music. I had spent a lot of time listening to uh, people like Lead Belly and a lot of the early songsters and musicians that kind of preceded the blues. And so when I started delving into minstrel history, I had I, I wasn't taking it on wholesale. I, w I had an introduction to the music because when I heard the Memphis jug band. See, I, I was in college, I did a class called Ethnic Notions, and we talked about literature that was uh, had racism in it. We talked about African American, Native American, and then also uh, sexual orientation. So we talked about gay, transgender, and, and all the different sex of uh, the sexes, which that's well said. But, um, but when we were talking about blackface minstrelsy, everything that we read about talked about how bad blackface minstrelsy was. But when I started listening to people like Gus Cannon and the Memphis Jug Band and some of the early songsters, I saw elements of the minstrel show within their performances. They weren't minstrels, but there were elements of it. And then of course, uh, you know, if you listen to people like Bob Wills or if you listen to even Jimmy Rogers, you see, you hear elements of this music within the music. So it, again, like I said, I, I was prepped with musical examples that I had come to enjoy and love, and, and then when I was delved into this history, I was able to look at it with an objective point of view. So I feel in a certain way, it's all about education, and educating yourself in the music, and once you're able to do that, it, you, can, you can step through the history and understand where people are coming from, because of course the social backdrop is also very complex as well, more so even than the music. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the term reclaiming, there's a implication that something that once was yours was either taken away or left behind. Is that a fair representation of uh, what the black culture felt about the banjo around the turn of the last century? I think that, like I said, like the social backdrop, I feel like there was the Great Migration happened within all this time as the minstrel show moved away. Because of course the minstrel show was a, just was a popular form of music, so it went beyond folk culture and became a theatrical form, almost like a, it's sort of what, what led into Broadway and into vaudeville in certain ways. So there's a theater culture that's grown around that. But in terms of folk culture, I feel like with black culture, there was a, a movement away from everything that was old, everything that was country, everything that was in the past, especially after the Civil War, and then especially after Reconstruction uh, crumbled in on itself. That was something that I think just black culture was will, willing and able to move away from all that. And I think that that was, that was the bigger thing that happened more so than saying, oh, well, we don't like this racist imagery and we're just going to get away from it, I think socially people were getting away from uh, the past culture, the old culture, and I think the banjo went out, went to the wayside with it. And of course there was the piano, the 
guitar, those became very popular as well. So it just was sort of a, a change altogether to show something that was a step away from slavery and a step away from the primitive culture that could be perceived. And of course, you know, music's music. So I think I've always been a big advocate to say that music in of itself isn't racist. Notes aren't racist, but the intent around them can be racist. And so I think that people kept on songs. Of course, they took out very racist lyrics. You know, for example, Gus Cannony. He does several songs that when you look at the original sheet music, they have a lot more words that he does not use when he recorded in the 20s. And I think that those are the ways that people were able to maintain the musical culture without uh, giving it up wholesale. But I think as a big notion, people just moved away from that past culture, went to the cities and made a new identity. You brought, uh, you brought up the songster. You're carrying on the songster to the tradition. Uh, it's an old term. I guess it used to mean just anyone that sang. But the songster tra tradition took on a, a, a association with, with black culture in the early 20th century. Uh, traveling musicians, playing a lot of different styles. Uh, tell us about what draws you to want to reclaim that style of performance. Well, I mean, when I first got in, again, it's, a, it's about the first exposure. I, I would, got interested in it by folk music. And uh, especially when I heard Lead Belly, I thought that that was just one of the most brilliant things I'd ever heard. Just, uh, there's a great set of uh, his Library of Congress recordings that Electra Records put out and it breaks down all the styles of music that he played in a very comprehensive way. And for me, I thought that was just brilliant that a single musician could play a lot of different styles. And of course, as the 20th century has ended out and the 21st century has come in and the post-digital revolution, the idea that people play multiple or listen to multiple styles of music isn't a crazy notion. But, you know, I always try to break it down into thinking that music is, is displayed in three different ways. You have uh, popular music on one level, then you have folk music, whatever that's defined as, vernacular music on a second level, and then the third level is just music that people are into, and that has no rhyme or reason to it. It's just people are into music, and they just, you know, you can, you can find people into Hawaiian music, into uh, music from Asia, and uh, you know, into German music, any type of music. And so, Lead Belly was one of those performers that really got me thinking about those ideas. And so, for me, as I was trying to figure out a way to um, be distinctive as a musician, when people asked me what style of music I did, I thought the, uh, the term songster, uh, which is derived from, a songster was a book of popular lyrics, like a little song book at first. And as the 19th century turned into the 20th century, then musicians just took on the songster moniker because they were like human jukeboxes. And I thought that that was a great and wonderful notion. And of course, since I focus on uh, music from the United States, I decided to take on the American songster as a moniker just because it's, uh, it was a way to, uh, to identify that I have interest in a lot of different types of music while not breaking out of the music as well. I try to, you know, fusion music is a, is a tough thing to, to, uh, yeah, like I said, I like to try to, I like to try to keep the, the authentic vocabulary of the music, and so fusion sometimes makes the, muddies the waters in these particular types of ways, and so I want to describe that I played a variety without saying, oh, I do folky, jazzy, ragtimey type of music, and be wishy-washy about it, so songster, ended up being a really nice term to work with that. The early songsters were really pre-blues, uh, but often had blues elements in them. Do you incorporate blues into your songster umbrella? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, blues are a part of it. Uh, you know, I was never a great blues singer, though, as, a, as my full main interest. I always liked folk songs as well as uh, early jazz in particular, and and as I started uh, delving into a lot of the music, I you know I I listened to the document records or I listened to the kind of the anthologies that would have complete recordings by different artists, and I'd find unique numbers because also I try to make sure I pick numbers that aren't the the main number that you would know by a certain artist. I find unique numbers that speak to me, 
because a lot of times most of this music hasn't been reinterpreted in any sort of way. It's usually the same five tunes that get recorded again and again. And uh, with that, I, I found that there were certain numbers that broke the mold, like a fellow like Charlie Patton, for example. He has songs that are, that are blues songs, like we would think about, and then he has these other songs that, again, the songsters that brought me into this place of this other music. When I looked in the blues scholarship, they couldn't say much about this other music. They just said, oh, these are just this gray area that they, that they cover that's string band music, and sometimes it's a ragtime, sometimes it's vaudeville, a little bit this, that, and the other. And I was, I was moved to that section of their repertoire. And so once I started finding more history and started reading more books that led to the songsters, I, I found that that was a, a unique space to be able to reach into. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sample? Oh, sure thing. Yeah, like um, one of them, for example, that, that also moved me was a fellow named Papa Charlie Jackson, who is not, not especially well known, but he was the first solo male blues singer to make popular records. And before that, you had uh, women, uh, blues queens, they called them, divas, that were backed by uh, jazz bands. And so Papa Charlie Jackson was one of the first people to break that mold. But, and unfortunately, since I flew out, I couldn't bring my big banjo. That's like the Papa Charlie Jackson six string banjo. But I'll do my little bit of four string here. So this is one that I've done for a while called Your Baby Ain't Sweet Like Mine.
Okay, uh, the way you were picking, bottom string, top string, is that, is that your just instinctive? Did you see someone do that? That was something that I picked up on my own, but that was something I learned from, from playing blues guitar. Mm -hmm. So you have a... Grabbing all those in unison at the top there. Yeah. The the song before that, I'm, I'm curious. Do you have a ukulele background at all? Because you were using a ukulele fan. Well, you know, funny enough, once I started getting into a lot of the Dixieland banjo and then the pop banjo, of course, then you guys have a great collection of Eddie Peabody. I just noticed that that was something that people did. That like, uh, you know, like that that sort of idea. I just. I just loved it, so I wanted to incorporate it. And, uh, there was a, another fellow, Gus Cannon, he was another guy that had a, a style that was extremely varied in the picking techniques, and I just went off of that idea and said, okay, well, I can do anything I want in terms of that. Uh, you know, playing the guitar, open G is the same as open G on the banjo, so I was able to freely move back and forth between these different styles, so when I learned a new song on the on the guitar, I could put it on the banjo and vice versa, and it's actually helped me a lot in terms of uh, picking out certain numbers just by the tone. The banjo really gives you a good ear for certain parts of the open open tuning and kind of the chord vocabulary, and that that's something that that moved me. And of course, open D on the guitar is uh, it's the same note structure as the banjo here, but with two two drum strings, a high string and a low string. So once I got into that, I realized that, you know, you can get into the chord variations. And when I, when I teach workshops, I spend the first couple of minutes uh, going over the chord shapes. So like G is here. And so that's, that's kind of an easy thing to be able to do. So especially with blues, you know, once you start getting into the different uh, inversions of the chords, then all of a sudden you can find some very interesting stuff like a... Do you ever use finger picks on your right hand other than the thumb pick? I never could make finger picks work for me. My fingers, they just didn't ever react right to having that. Uh, but the thumb pick, I, I ended up, uh, you know, I, when I started the guitar first, I kept dropping the pick in the sound hole. I used to have a regular <laughs> one, and, and it just it drove me crazy. But then I saw a thumb pick, and I decided to pick that up in the music store. And uh, then later on, I saw People like Lead Belly used a, used a thumb pick, and people like Lightning Hopkins as well used a thumb pick. So I, I figured, okay, I, I think I'm on the, on the right road with getting that. And so it gives me a, a way to be able to pick. But the finger picks on the other fingers, I never really could make those work for me. It just never felt quite right. You, your hands wear out with the steel strings on the skin. Uh, do you ever pop them open and bleed or anything? No, no, I've been fortunate <laughs> in that way. I, 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 I think I, I got, I got fat, fat fingers on the tips at least here that, that seem to work out all right. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, um, it's like, um, you know, like I, let me play you another, I'll play you another one here. This is, this is kind of a more, a more uh, involved piece here. This is a Gus Cannon one. This is a one called My Money Never Runs Out. So this one is more of one that as I started delving into the history and understanding uh, the early minstrelsy, instead of it being a blues number, I started seeing that it was somewhere halfway between a minstrel song and a blues number. And this is actually two different songs, one called My Money Gives Out, which was written by a, a, 
a black minstrel songwriter named Irving Jones, who was extremely popular in the 1890s, and another one by a guy named Will Rossiter, who was another uh, black, black face uh, performer, and he had a song called uh, I Don't Care If I Never Wake Up. And so when, when Gus Cannon recorded it in, in uh, 1927 for the Paramount uh, Record Company, he put the two tunes together. I don't know why he did it, because we don't really have any, anything where he's talking about that, but it's a, a very interesting composite piece. And of course, in the, with the advent of hip hop, and, and, and then after rap and hip hop, then you had Dirty South rap. That brought a whole other Southern vernacular language that to me is very similar to a lot of this early songster and early black vaudeville performance. So anyway, this, this one my mind never, never runs out of so what they call a swagger song. You know? <laughs> Let's touch on uh, a new thing for you, or a more recent thing for you, uh, black cowboys and their, their traditions and their music. For those of you who are not uh, thinking about it, and no matter what Hollywood tells us uh, and perpetuates, uh, there were about 35,000 cowboys in the Old West, and at least 25% of them were black. And they had, it, and it wasn't a segregated time, was it? Not, not in the strict sense that we would think of now, where you know we would think of like separate but equal, then everybody's in separate facilities. But this was sort of a sort of a working class culture, and also it was there wasn't room for that just because everybody had to work together on a team. So it was one of these situations where kind of like the rules of the old South, where your your neighbor could help you at any point. So you really didn't want to upset your neighbor because if you were in a situation that was uh, detrimental, they could they could either help or not help, and that was something that, especially on the range, if you had something like a stampede or if you had some sort of uh, situation where you needed help, you wanted your neighbor to be helping you. So that was that was something that was uh, very prevalent in the in the cowboy culture. Uh, banjos were a big thing too, you know. Um, I'm originally from Phoenix, so the subject interested me just in a general sense, just because my, my own family culture, my, my father's father came over from East Texas, and my, and my grandmother was from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and then they, they were part of the Western migration that came over, in, uh, particularly in the 40s, and they uh, moved over and settled in Flagstaff, Arizona, and then my grandfather had his church in the Holbrook, Arizona, which was one of the first uh, places that cattle could be brought to Arizona by, by railroad. And so um, I had had very intimate history with, the, with Holbrook. It's still a very small town along uh, Route 66. But all, all that stuff is uh, really prevalent in, in just the general history. But, but black cowboys, 
you know, like uh, I went to the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada, and uh, they were telling me about one of the first people to write down cowboy songs, a fellow named Jack Thor. And so he was a, a banjo player. He played a, 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 a little uh, piccolo banjo. And he carried that with him uh, on the trail. And in his autobiography, he talks about how he worked for a fellow named Addison Jones, who was one of the few uh, trail bosses that was an African American. And, and so Thor gets this job. And the first night he's in uh, New Mexico, he he hears the sounds of the black cowboys around the campfire playing the banjo and singing songs. And there's a particular song that he heard uh, about a horse called Dodging Joe that he wanted to he wanted to write it down because he'd never heard a song like that. And from there he realized that there was a unique cowboy culture, a unique uh, set of songs that were developing through the cowboy camps just because they didn't have anything better to do and they needed to find some way of playing these songs. And to me, I read between the lines a little bit in the way that he talks about a lot of these songs developed out of the loneliness and out of the, uh, the goodwill that kept one cowboy wanted to have toward another. And it almost, it's almost like how we would now think of people describing the blues. But since there wasn't a, a word for it, there wasn't a blues music to talk about, there's a, a part of me that thinks that those traces of the blues are what what drew Jack Thorpe in. And then he, he developed the very first songster, Songs of the Cowboys, in 19, uh, 1908, and uh, followed a couple years after by John Lomax, uh, who was, went on the same notion. He, uh, he met a, a black uh, bartender out in, uh, I, think he was in, I think he was in St. Louis or San Antonio, I can't remember where, but he was, he was, he was uh, told this guy could sing songs, and. Uh, he had to wait until the guy was off work, and then the guy sang him a variation on a song called Home on the Range. And Home on the Range ended up becoming the, still the state song of Kansas, but it became the national western anthem. And that was from this, this black cowboy who said he had traveled with, um, with, uh, with Sam Bass and a couple other, uh, couple other famous cowboys who have songs about them. And so that was, that was, that's a big part of this uh, whole story of uh, the Cowboys, is that as people were moving away from the old culture, like I was telling you, they moved in a variety of directions. We usually think of them moving to the cities in the north or the Midwest, but they, there was an earlier generation in the 1880s, 1890s that moved out west. And west of the Mississippi used to be the end of the United States, and so you find that there's a different history through each state, particularly in Oklahoma, but uh, they have, there's its own, its own unique history of when they made, when they had the Indian Territory out here, then they had Oklahoma, the state, there were a lot of different steps along the way, and so you had African American culture that kind of was right under the radar before they, before any of these places were established as like the states as we think of now, you have a lot of variation that's that's out there, and I'll even mention with, with Oklahoma, they did the first uh, movie uh, with the Black Cowboys, the star, um, a song called, uh, no, a movie called uh, The Bulldogger, starring Bill Pickett, and um, that was a uh, filmed in Bowley, Oklahoma, you know, and so they were one of the places that had a well-established uh, Black Cowboy culture, rodeo culture that that you know that pronounced that, you know, they, they were a part of it. Was there a segregated body of music in the Black Cowboys, or, or, or was it kind of crossing over all the time? It was always crossing over, just because, again, the nature of the, the work, everybody was working together all the time. And so uh, one particular song, uh, Goodbye Old Paint, is one that is, uh, was documented as a, by a, a, a white performer, but he always mentioned that he learned it from a from a black cowhand that um, that worked on the trail, you know, and that was that was a part of it was a, it's, it's a combination of the the ballads of the British Isle and also the blues and and a lot of the songs like a song like Little Joe the Wrangler is um, they feature the melodies of minstrel songs, so they're structured around this minstrel music and popular music at the time, and then they just changed the words to it to fit the cowboy theme. Mm -hmm. 
Can you play something off your new album? Oh, sure. One of the songs I ended up using was a Lead Belly number. And this is one that was a... This is a song called uh, Poor Howard's Dead and Gone. And uh, this is one that was a... Uh, that was a song that Lead Belly said was the first song sung by the first Negro fiddler freed from slavery. And then I decided to put it in a, a medley next to Wanna Dig a Hole to Put the Devil In, which is a, a little song about uh, that uh, Lead Belly said that the boys out in the field in, uh, would sing this little song, Wanna Dig a Hole to Put the Devil In, when they, when they saw the boss and they wanted to say something about him, but they couldn't really directly say anything about him. So they just say, oh, we want to go home with the devil in. <laughs> so I'm going to play a little bit of both of these numbers here for you. Yes. 
Dom Flemings. Thank you, Dom. I want to thank you again for sharing really a wonderful piece of this banjo and music history and your life with us. Thank you, Dom Flemings. We hope you've enjoyed visiting 2017 and Dom Flemons and banjo history like you will never hear it anywhere else. It has been our honor and pleasure to bring you some really important banjo history information today. And we want you to tune in every Saturday for Virtual at Noon from the American Banjo Museum. Join us next week when we take you to the Banjo Gathering and the American Banjo Museum's collection of late 18th century classic era banjos. It's really a collection you'll never see anywhere else, and we'd love to share it with you next week on Virtual at Noon from the American Banjo Museum. <laughs>